Okey, kita ingin terus saja ke Davos untuk di sesi uh, WEF 2022, di sesi di mana tajuk pada petang ini adalah Rebuilding Societal Trust. Kita terus saja mengikuti sesi ini. The media could have even done a much better job. I know my employer Deutsche Welle amazed me at the beginning of the pandemic. My boss Manuela Casper Claric man managed to set up an entire new format which became our most watched show ever and won awards, etc. Uh, our COVID-19 special. I mean, it was a no-brainer. It was in the middle of a pandemic. People were hungry for information. My job was to host it, and I'm a business anchor. I'd never done science before. So the learning curve was like this. But I wouldn't say it was like that for everyone around the world. And less independent media is not going to help that situation. We're seeing that in Russia. But let me introduce our panel. Amy Weaver is going to talk about the companies and corporates role in all of this. She's CFO at Salesforce. We're going to get the government view from Senator John Hickenlooper, who's from Colorado, or senator in Colorado, yeah. Um, Cheryl Dorsey, representing our civil society uh, from Echo and Green. We're going to hear some interesting debate today. If you've got questions, we'll open up to the floor about 15 minutes uh, to go. We've got a 45-minute debate for you. And we're going to start with the government. Is, is our government the least trusted out of the groups <laughs> represented <laughs> here today, John? You know, that's such an unfair question, because <laughs> I think everyone in the room knows the answer, but I am now forced to relate it. Yeah, the, the certainly, if you look at the government in Washington, D.C., at least in the United States, it, its approval rating is about 12%. It's just, wow. I don't think it's ever been lower. Uh, local government, state government is, is a good bit better, and then when you get to local governments, people's neighborhoods, their cities, their towns, uh, it goes up quite a bit. But there's, uh, the Senate has, uh, and the House, but Congress has really struggled to find their bearings. and. So often, the, the group process means that they have such divergent opinions about how they should report out as a body that what the public sees and perceives, and especially with so much social media, they see conflict, endless conflict, and, and they feel frustration. Why does all of this information that goes out from governments firstly have to go through some sort of editing and approval process rather than giving us the hard facts? Well, and that's another strongly negative perception of government is the fact that there is this endless review. Um, and it's just only gotten worse with the, the rise and the impact of social media. So now one misstatement, and you saw this especially in the, in the primary campaigns for, for the, in 2000, uh, to, uh, 2020, 2000, in 2020, where you saw every candidate carefully tailoring their response to every question in the debates because they knew that one misstep, one misstatement would be repeated endlessly. On a, on, and the same thing with cable news. You, if a politician goes on the news and, sure. and says something wrong and they don't catch themselves, it will be used to, as, a, as a, a bludgeon against them in their next campaign. Why shouldn't it be? Well, because they're human. The, that's the, the regrettable part about the Senate and the House is that they're all too human. Mm. Uh, they're mostly as divided as they are, my experience there, I'm, you know, all of a year and a half, so I'm still a, uh, I'm one of the oldest freshman senators in a long time. Uh, but I think that they are mostly good people. And I, I still feel very hopeful that the Senate will be able to, to get through some of the, of the, the log jam, right? This just constriction that makes progress almost feel impossible and find certain things, some of the most difficult things there's never been a better time to resolve it. Uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, immigration. Everybody needs employees all over the world that we need to have much more rapid responses to immigration. Uh, energy. If we, as we do this, I mean, we can't accelerate fast enough to address climate change. And yet, we saw that when, if you're not careful and you have not done sufficient planning, the, the price of crude oil can, can swing up and down out of control and working people, the people that can least afford to deal with the consequences are suddenly spending $100 to fill up their, their automobile with gasoline. And 
you know, this is something Americans, Europeans are more accustomed to high prices for petrol, but uh, Americans get, again, just increases their frustration. I think a lot of people expect a news anchor, a politician, uh, a CFO to be superhuman. Um, they think we're paid to be superhuman, but they do enjoy the human uh, aspect that uh, we can be real people and, and open ourselves up. Is, is that something, Amy, that um, can help a company, for example, to increase its trust? I think it can. I think it comes down to transparency. Mm -hmm. Now, trust and tra transparency are not the same thing. They're really the opposite sides of a coin. But the more transparent, you can use transparency really to build trust. And at Salesforce, trust is something that has been really intrinsic to the company for all of our 23 years. We have five corporate values that we really try to test every major decision we make against. It's trust, customer success, innovation, equality, and most recently, sustainability. Now, over 23 years, we've tweaked some of the wording, we have changed the order, but one thing that has never changed is that trust is always our number one value. And I think that this is not just the right thing to do, I think it's smart business. And especially today, I look at customers, I look at employees, and they vote. They vote with their feet. Customers want to do business with com companies that they trust and companies that are transparent with them. Employees, especially with this great resignation or great reshuffle, have really never had more power. And they wanna work for companies that they trust and companies that they believe have their back. And that makes it smart business to be focusing on trust. And companies that actually have an opinion. Yes. Because in the past, it was a case of companies having to stay neutral on so many different levels, right. working and operating in so many different countries with so many regimes or governments. Now they're speaking out, aren't they? They are. They are. Companies have, uh, you know, as we say, obviously, at the World Economic Forum, companies have an incredible platform yeah. for change and to do good. And I think that that power is being used. Um, Cheryl, could you tell me a bit about civil society and your group and uh, how it's making a difference? Sure. So maybe I'll back up a little bit. And I'll start by saying a little bit about uh, Echoing Green, which is a um, organization that works in the field of social innovation, which is really about sort of developing and deploying innovative and effective solutions to drive transformational uh, change to sort of grapple with our most intractable social um, and environmental problems. So it's about a particular kind of transformational leader who thinks a lot about the downstream effects of when there is no trust. So I think civil society leaders think a lot of, not only about the what, but the why. So why is there such a lack of trust? And I really appreciated you starting with the pandemic, which we're um, sort of coming out of and still trying to reckon with. And there's sort of the preeminent scholar in this area, Frank Snowden, talks about the role of pandemics in society. He says they simply amplify the structural inequities that already exist. Yes. And that's what this pandemic did um, so disastrously, especially for communities of color, approximate communities, indigenous communities. Um, and so why um, was trust frayed? But it was also sort of, you got to talk about the baseline. Why was there not much trust to begin with? And there are a whole host of factors, everything from sort of the pace and scale of change, where people who you talked about, what is trust? Trust is really sort of a very firm belief about the reliability um, or ability of something or something. So what happens when you are used to a particular way the world is supposed to work, and then forces like mass migration, increasing multiculturalism, soaring inequality, um, sort of change the way you believe the world should be and the way you want it to be. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing we need to think about, as well as that our institutions that were really sort of set up to work in a 20th century um, framework, no longer serving us in this rapidly changing world. So all of those sort of diminish the level of trust. And it's civil society organizations that deal with that in community every single day and try to sort of create um, sort of a safety net, a baseline um, for folks who are really feeling uh, the downstream effects of what it means when our institutions aren't working for enough of us. So we've heard about transparency, effective institutions is another pillar here. And that's what people are expecting, real benefits. So for example, from governments, um, how have governments actually fared during the pandemic considering the record amounts of money they've spent on people? you know, trying to get through this pandemic. Well, and, and let me just posit 
uh, we talked about this a little bit before, that governments uh, and nonprofits are somewhat of a disadvantage when you look at the who attracts the talent in our, in our world today. And roughly, of all the employees in the United States, the, the, the total workforce, it's, it's roughly 40% uh, is in business, or maybe some are a little bit, even, even a little less than that. 60% are either in government or in nonprofits. And yet, you look at the advanced degrees in organizational management, there's only, I don't know, maybe a dozen that, that are oriented towards nonprofits and, and civil society. And yet there are literally hundreds of MBAs. So 75% of all the advanced degrees in organizational management are in business. And so we are at a disadvantage starting out. Now, it, and it's interesting how governments have fa fared, because one thing, we don't really understand a pandemic. If we understood it better from the beginning, we wouldn't have such problems. But sure. China looked very smart in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now they're not looking so smart. And we looked clumsy. In, in the beginning and then got smart and then all of a sudden we declared victory when we should have known that there was victory, that, you know, there were uh, imminent changes and challenges and variations uh, in the offing. So I think we looked, in, we did not have, as, as someone, I've got a, a master's in earth and environmental science in geology, so I am, in the old days, some many years ago, many decades ago, a scientist. We didn't have the, enough facts and enough information to make decisions accurately. And the, the public has very high expectations. So we made mistakes. Uh, we went off on the wrong path. And yet, smart people were doing the very best that they could. And I think that's the, one of the lessons here is that, uh, A, we need more talent. You know, you look at Singapore. Singapore now, is, the, the government of Singapore is able to, they pay more. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, uh, training programs that go forward, uh, I think we need to do that in more places around the world. The, my, my father is a friend with the writer uh, Kurt Vonnegut in college, and, and Kurt Vonnegut once wrote that a truly terrifying moment is when we realize the country is being run by the people we went to high school with. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's part of the problem. Well, would you, would you get more talent in these sectors if you had more accountability? Absolutely. I think that's... Part of the issue, uh, when I was, uh, you know, I went from being an entrepreneur to mayor and then a governor, but I would, I, I, I expended am amazing amounts of time and reached out to the business community as someone who'd come from business, wanted to use the lessons of small business in making government more, more trusted. I mean, I, I wanted to make government work. And it was tremendously difficult to attract talent from the business community just to come in for a few years and you know they felt that there would that the risks were far outweighed the benefits. Uh, and in Colorado now we have a program now the uh, uh, it's called Civitas, but it's 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 corporations take a young rising executive, someone in their early 30s, maybe the mid 30s, and they they come one day a month and they follow they work for one of the cabinet members in, in the state government and they follow them around. They get to learn what government looks like and see that it's not perfect. Uh, and, you know, the, I think the transparency that Amy was talking about, that's the, the best form of accountability we have. And, and government, they're very fearful of that transparency. Amy, would you have uh, some sort of advice for John as far as attracting more talent? I mean, a company like Salesforce, uh, I don't know, you probably don't have a problem with that. <laughs> well, we have uh, brought on more than 20,000 employees in the last year, so I think we're doing pretty well at attracting some wonderful talent. But I would really go back to what you were saying on transparency and accountability. And as Cheryl was talking about, what is trust? And it's really this belief that it's going to be reliable and what you're doing is fair. And I think back to, I think it was five, six years ago now, and we had two uh, female executives go to our then CEO, now co-CEO, Mark Benioff, and say that they thought, they weren't sure, they didn't have the data, but they thought there might be a difference um, on pay based on gender. And what Mark committed to is he said, you know, we're going to do a study. We're going to dive in. We don't know what we're going to find, but at the end of it, we are going to announce the results publicly, and we're going to fix it. 
Um, now, I'll tell you, I was general counsel at the time, and as a woman, I was thrilled. As general counsel, I thought, I'm not sure this is such a great idea. <laughs> and sure enough, we did the study, and it turned out that we weren't perfect. And we had to pay more than $3 million to make salaries equal at the company. We also realized we were going to have to do that every single year. And over the last six, seven years, we have paid out more than $16 million. But what that does is it shows people you don't, you, that we're going to be transparent, we have their back, and we're gonna be reliable and do it every single year. And I think this builds trust with your employees and I think it attracts the best. Cheryl, can you give us some advice? Sure, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> uh, just sort of, um, uh, again, from my perch, working with some extraordinary civil society leaders from around the world. And I think um, sort of the bad news is that once trust is lost, it is very difficult to, to get it back. There's no magic cure, right? There just isn't. But the good news is, with sort of dedication and commitment and stick to itness, um, every day putting one foot in front of the other and just doing things together, we have hope of getting to the other side. So I would say four pieces of advice. One thing is what the senator said is go local. Driving um, opportunities and activities to the most hyper-local level possible um, is the way forward because it's the easiest way to build um, higher levels of trust. I'll give you an example. I was having dinner with some social innovators last night, including a wonderful young man who's here as part of the Schwab Foundation of Social Entrepreneurs, Kennedy Obebe. And he runs an organization called Shining Hope for Communities, which is transforming urban informal settlements in Kenya. It's the largest grassroots organization in Kenya. And by making things work, executing on the ground every day, um, starting a girl's school in Kibera, um, economic empowerment opportunities, opening a health care um, facility for residents um, of these informal settlements, um, and then delivering um, clean water through a really cool innovative aerial piping system. Um, he is executing on the ground every day for about a half a million residents. And that accelerated during the pandemic up to two million folks providing information, vaccines, and all of that kind of stuff. So hyper-local in the community, people who have got um, levels of trust that are truly sticky, right, and durable. The second piece of advice is start building things together. You gotta make the road by walking. Um, there are other social innovators in the Echoing Green community, two extraordinary uh, women, Morgan Dixon and Vanessa Garrison, who started something called Girl Trek, which in my country, the United States, is the largest public health organization for African American women. And it gets, it's trying to get a million African American women to walk at least 30 minutes a day um, to sort of combat um, chronic diseases that so um, bedevil um, women who look like me. And it's all about sitting in church basements, talking to your neighbors to get them to come together to drive collective action. So just do it. Third piece of advice is you've got to build bridges across difference, right? Sort of, sort of the notion of human being. We're actually fairly segregated, and you know we've got genius geniuses like Isabel Wilkerson who talk about caste or inherited hierarchy. We're far too segregated. But if you start coming together across difference and starting to fix things, um, you have a way forward. Um, and I'll give an example from my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. An incredible social innovator, Sarah Heminger who is working with the most disadvantaged young people in Baltimore City with the lowest um, academic and opportunity um, outcomes and matching them with me uh, mentors from sort of the Johns Hopkins community, the business community, and has had transformative impact on their lives, but has also fundamentally changed the social fabric of Baltimore, right? When we see each other in a fundamentally new way, that builds a level of trust that is just priceless. And the last thing is you got to invest in a new breed of leader for the 21st century. I am biased. I think social innovators, the way they innovate, the way they build trust, the way they get proximate, the way that they um, are community-led and demand-driven um, is the type of leader that we need to add to the cadre of folks like the senator um, and Amy. Um, and I think civil society has got to be front and center of rebuilding um, sort of this social capital that's fundamental to building healthy democracies. Senator, what do you think? I agree, I, and I think that <laughs> I'd be a fool not to agree. Um, I think that there's a, uh, <clears throat> a a deep appetite for different kinds of leaders. If, if you look back, and I did a, I kind of have an amateur survey of the senators. I try to go once a week to visit a, a different senator who I haven't spent time with. I go spend an hour and just 
Who are you? Where'd you come from? Why'd you get into, when did you start wanting to help others? Why'd you, where's, where'd you come from by, in terms of service? And as a group, as diverse as our political opinions are, there are certain real common elements um, that, that cross over racial differences or, 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 or other differences that, I mean, the, the number of lawyers, I mean, I don't know what the percentage of our population that are lawyers are, but I don't think it's that high. It's certainly not whatever. I think we're at 65% or 70% of, of all the senators. 65%, let's stick with that. It's ridiculously high. Well, Either our lawyers or work in that universe of, of legal, uh, legal calisthenics, as, as I would call it. Uh, I think that as you get more social innovators would be one great opportunity to look for uh, people, I think the uh, the, the nonprofit wor world, on a larger basis, has a tremendous number of people that, if they if they felt that they could get things done and would be not held, you know, unfairly accountable, right, would be held up to ridicule for something that was an honest mistake. I think there's a, another tremendous reservoir. And then, lastly, I think young business entrepreneurs should, you know, if they can willing to take four years or eight years out of their life and give back, uh, that would add so much power uh, into start with local government, but all the way up into the US Senate. If they're going to get paid better, though, in a job at Salesforce, how are you going to get those young people? Well, certainly, we always are, when I was governor, we were always on the lookout for really enlightened companies that would help <laughs> one of their employees come work for two years or four years and make up some of the difference really? as a, a form of scholarship. Oh, yeah, we had that. Which is a great lobbying opportunity for a company. <laughs> <laughs> the best. The best. <laughs> but I think, yeah, when you go there, it's not all about compensation. It is about values. Companies or employees want to work at a company that reflects their values and also that I believe is mission driven. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to go to a job every day and kind of clock in and clock out. You want to feel connected. You want to feel that you're making a difference. And that can be easier in the nonprofit world and the government world. I think corporations need to lean into that as well. So we have a lot to take away from what you're doing in the government and what's going on in civil society as well. Cheryl, I wanted to read something to you that I found interesting. Uh, I read that the public trust deficit may contain the germs of its own cure. By highlighting dysfunction and, and inequity, people may rise up with new coalitions and new solutions that in turn bridge social divides, realign power structures, and rebuild public confidence. Can we hope that that's going to just suddenly happen? on its own, or do we really have to re restructure things to make sure um, this recovery does happen and that this recovery is equitable and fair? No, I, I agree um, with that quote. I mean, I guess, you know, as you were reading it, I was thinking about um, sort of the great civil rights leader, Frederick Douglass, who said, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. This, this does not happen <laughs> passively, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's about organizing, it's about um, shifting power, um, and that is um, difficult because, again, sort of these um, structural forces of um, oppression are fabulously effective. They've been around for thousands of years, um, and they are particularly good at oppressing a variety of groups through a variety of reasons, right? They're very good at segregating resources per, for particular groups, sort of... Um, creating inherited group advantage or disadvantage, limiting self-determination. So until you give people um, the opportunity to come together, to organize, to mobilize, to essentially create um, social movements, that's the way you bend the arc of history towards justice. It's the, the, way, the only way it has happened. And I will say, I'm sort of a traditional social justice baby. I got my start doing racial health disparities work in inner city Boston. But I became increasingly attracted to social innovation as an alliance-based model for change. Mm -hmm. um, I would often sit in rooms. And I deeply believe that um, racial um, equity, which is a process of eliminating racial disparities and making it better for all of us. But I often um, could see people sitting across the table from me thinking, you're actually telling me that I have to lose for you to win. And I was not saying that at all, but it was how it landed. And the lore of social innovation was um, we can all create new and shared public value together. And sort of this blurring of sectoral boundaries between government, 
business and civil society really created this new way forward. So look, I'm all in, I believe in it, and I think this opportunity to mobilize and build together is actually gonna be the way we sort of um, deal with that um, deficit of trust. And I love the concept of civil society, government, and businesses working together. I think the beginning of the pandemic really put to rest the idea that corporations were separate, that a corporation could just function on its own, paying attention only to its profit. It, within you know, days of the beginning of the, of the pandemic, it became so clear that corporations are interdependent on their communities. You know, we needed schools to be open for our employees to be able to work and do their best. We needed the hospitals to be functioning and not be overrun. We needed local businesses to continue and to thrive. It really showed stakeholder capitalism. And it showed that you have to be you have to be attentive to all of your stakeholders, and all three of these areas need to work together to restore the trust and really to be effective and serve all of our citizens as well as possible. Do you have any more examples of where we see government, civil society, and companies working together? You know, I think one that was very good was actually around PPE, when we had the shortages at the beginning of the pandemic. And the government in the US was not able to source enough PPE to keep our, our hospitals functioning. You know, there were a number of companies that really stepped up. Honeywell is a great example. You know, they, re they reopened factories, they put people to work. I think they created 500 jobs in the meantime. Salesforce stepped in to source PPE from China. And a lot, along with a number of other companies that worked with us, we were able to bring in PPE to San Francisco, to New York, to London. Uh, more recently to Fiji, to uh, Mongolia. We relied on what we knew and what we could do and then partnered with the government on what they were best at. And in doing that, we're able to serve a lot of communities in need. Do governments, to come back to a point you were making, Cheryl, about social movements, do, do governments initiate enough social movements or get behind enough so or do they have any involvement no 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 no, <laughs> no, no. And then i'll, why, I'll defer to the senator on that i mean social movements really are about um, sort of community voice and sort of a bottom-up approach sort of um, the power of proximity i mean a activism is really um, predicated on this notion of convention and those of us who are privileged um, think conventional things are fine because we're benefiting from the system but those with less power who are pushing against the system to make a change and the government is the system um, so it is rare um, that governments um, lead um, but if they're doing their job well they follow they listen to the voice of communities and then they try to shape that into policy deliverables that hopefully become the rising tide that lifts all boats but I, I'll defer to the senator or at right least now. create a platform for that yeah. movement to get momentum what, what do you think John well I, I, again I would be a fool not to agree um, <laughs> you say that time and again <laughs> I, I, I think that there are a lot of examples where government and nonprofits and business work together we yesterday Scott Miller who is the ambassador to Switzerland from the United States and from Colorado uh, told us a story of, about the lack of formula uh, especially for kids that have special needs in terms of formula don't don't respond to all types of baby formula, that he went to Nestle's here, and in a day and a half, he had a commitment to 80 tons of formula, that, and, they had, and he was able to arrange a flight to make sure that got to the right places in the United States. So, so that's, there, there are lots of examples, but systemic change, which is what I think Cheryl's talking about, doesn't happen without some level of, of, of listening. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot, of, a lot of centers go out of our way to try and, I try to spend more time with uh, what I call grassroots constituents, so activist groups, uh, you know, uh, nonprofits that are working for specific issues uh, than I ever spend with, with lobbyists. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a necessary model if you're gonna hear about, you know, the first time, it was actually when I was running for the Senate, I, I heard about the, the differences in what African-American women, when they're going, giving birth, Absolutely. what choices they're giving, given at the hospital, much more limited choices, uh, much more dangerous choices. They're, they don't have, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable. And as you go deeper into it, unless we're able to get more African-American women into the healthcare system at all levels, not just doctors, but doulas and nurses, everything, at every level, though that, that entrenched 
bias is going to is going to remain. And I thought, you know, what Amy was saying in terms of here's a a real forward-looking company that looked at gender and compensation and exposed it, and they have to do it every year. And every year, you continue to find gender discrepancies. These are biases that are, they don't make people bad people, but the, that bias is built in at a deeper level than most of us recognize. The last question I want to ask before going to you guys, uh, to the audience, is about engaging citizens, about social inclusion, but how do you get people excited, get people engaged to actually join these movements, to join your company because of your mission, um, to even turn up to the polls to vote. You know, it's, it's incredible how many people complain about the government they have that they voted in. How do you get people engaged? How do you engage your citizens? How do you get people in included in these conversations and movements? Well, I think when you start with voting, it's absolutely critical. And it's important for corporations to support their employees in allowing them the time yep. to vote. We also um, provide volunteers uh, on a nonpartisan basis in both the United States and in Germany to work at the polls to provide, there's always a shortage, always providing them. We try to, to provide, we call them trails on our trailhead learning system, ways to become engaged with local government, uh, ways to learn about civic responsibility, and ways to you know, really get out the vote as well, because I think it all starts from that. John? You know, I think there are a lot of different ways. Uh, Great leaders, uh, uh, Stacey Abrams in, in Georgia comes to mind as someone who just decided that voting needed to be transformed and revolutionized and that, that way too many low-income people were voting. And she took it on and she got people fired up. And she went, she went all over the country to raise money and, and made Georgia a test case that's now being replicated in a number of different states. Uh, the second thing that I think is useful is to look at human nature and take those inherent parts of human nature and, and fan the embers that are there. So competition, which many activists will, will disdain, we have now competitions between, in universities between the percentage of uh, voting eligible st students, mm -hmm. what percentage actually go and vote. And that's now happening, forget the name of the nonprofit in Boston, but that is all over. So Colorado State University, University of Colorado, they know how many kids are, are eligible to vote, and they can find, without revealing anything individually, who has voted and what their percentage is. And so that's happening now all over the country. And watch the, the turnout of college students is increasing. That kind of stuff, because they're competing, and, and, and they're, you know, it becomes kind of a, 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 a source of pride for the, for the student body. Wouldn't there be a greater voter turnout if the people voting were voting for someone who looked like them or represented them or... We're at the same age even, you know, we've got so many young, dynamic leaders who've popped up around the world, New Zealand, Denmark, um, who are doing fantastic things and are suddenly engaging a much younger voter body. Yeah, well, that's, I, I couldn't agree more, but I think you also have to recognize that when you get to statewide races, you're not always going to have someone who looks the same as, as, as you look. Mm -hmm. And we have to get past that. Uh, in other words, I think in, uh, in Colorado, we have our, our uh, General Assembly is almost a majority uh, of minority, mm -hmm. and yet that's not the population description of, of the entire state. Obviously, people are saying, we're going, after the, we're going to go after the best person. Yeah. And in many cases, that could be a person of color, uh, you know, it's some other individual that is outside the, the voter's identity, and yet we're able, or, or that, that political candidate is able to convince people this is the right person. Can I just add? Just add Go for it. Like, I couldn't uh, always, I thought the comments were, were spot on, and the only thing I would add around voting is, like, don't suppress it. Like, stop suppressing um, folks' a right to be heard. Um, and then I thought there was um, real relevance to what you all were saying about, um, Senator, especially about young people. I mean, there are lots of academic studies that show that, like, age, level of education, and race are closely tied to levels of trust, right? And we know um, that engaging young people is sort of critical for democratic hygiene, for society change. And it's interesting, there's a very famous civil rights icon, um, a sociologist, Joyce Ladner, um, who was, um, as a teenager, very involved in the civil rights movement. 
And when asked why, she said, because it was the most exciting thing you could do as a young person. And I see that same thing in social innovation. Young people know that the system is not working for them or for enough of us. They want to burn it down. They want to fix it. And social innovation is exciting, right? It is fun. It's sort of, you know, shark tank for social change. They want to be <laughs> engaged in it. All their friends are doing. It's creative. So how do you create that ecosystem um, to celebrate it, support it, and mobilize even more of them? Um, and I think by doing that, um, it's the kind of um, catalyst that we need to um, really um, sort of make a dent in some of these issues. Some questions uh, from our audience. Uh, here at the front, we've got three or four questions. Starting over here. Hello, David Dow from the Surrey Cup Global Shapers. Um, thank you so much for all your contributions and also the harmony at the panel. That's beautiful to see it. I think collaboration is really important to bring back trust to society. One perspective I'm missing a little bit is the, is the um, perspective of science. So we have this mm. underlying trust-generating machine that is the global scientific community. And during the pandemic, and also if you look at climate change currently, how come that governments and also private companies oftentimes disagree with the scientific facts that are overlaid and therefore causing potentially mistrust in society if you don't basically during the pandemic disagree if vaccination is good or bad, if mass wearing is good or bad, or if even the necessary steps to, um, to stop climate change is not done or fulfilled um, by governments and leaders in public and private sectors. So I'll take a shot at that first. And that is such a big problem. And part of it is scientists don't run for office. Again and again and again, if I was sitting next to, I sit between John Ossoff and Mark Kelly on the Senate floor. It's like when you join the Senate, it's, it's like going into fifth grade and your homeroom where you sit has a lot to do with <laughs> how good a year you will have. And Mark Kelly is an astronaut. And he was saying, I was saying, well, you know, we're two of the only scientists here. He goes, no, no, I'm an engineer. I said, but you've done experiments in space. He goes, I didn't design them. You designed experiments when you were getting your master's in geology. So we went and looked down. If, if you, well, there were several MDs, and I said, well, they're scientists. He goes, no, no, they're engineers of the body. They're not doing research. And if you, if you go by that, that definition, I'm the only scientist out of 100 people wow. in the Senate. And when you don't have that that representation. People don't realize that for most of human history, the truth, people, what people believed was true, was dictated to them by the king or the head of their tribe or, or, the, or the church for a long time. And it really wasn't until you know, Descartes and, and uh, Isaac Newton and, and the Enlightenment that suddenly science, we began to feel we could measure and test what the truth is. Well, now with the internet, People are testing it all the time, and they feel they've come to a conclusion on their own that is a real truth. And that, that has created a mistrust in science. I think there's a, a, a part where science gets blamed. Also, sometimes science doesn't have all the facts, and yet we have uh, inadvertently portrayed to the public that science is the, right, is the solution to all things. And science isn't perfect. It, you know, look at COVID around the world. Science is... Uh, disagreed and made mistakes. Well, science is continuously developing, isn't it? But I felt at ease living in Germany, a country that had a leader who was a scientist, Angela Merkel. Yeah. It made a huge difference in the communication of, of so many of these problems. Um, we have another question here. Yeah, my name is Bob Wardrop. I'm an economic sociologist at the University of Cambridge, and I study, actually, the structure of the financial system. Mm. And I have a quick comment. First of all, if I'm running an organization today and concerned about trust, go back and read an old sociology paper called The Comparative Advantage of Trust <laughs> by Barney and Hansen. It's really foundational. How do you actually, as an organization, create strong, weak forms of trust? Which ones really give you comparative advantage? But my question is really about um, economic, socioeconomic transformation and how sources of trust change during those periods. In the United States, if you go back to the industrial revolution, or the uh, industrial sort of, um, let's call it uh, 2.0, you know, 1840, 1920, railroads, telegraph, that's when government came in, regulation came in, institutionalized intermediation came in, because we couldn't trust dealing with individuals in close proximity. We're going through another period now, and so the question to the panel is, are we going into a world where the new sources of trust may be highly decentralized, autonomous system structures, mm -hmm. like we're seeing in the development of cryptocurrencies, 
and the decentralized, what is called broadly DeFi, certainly in the financial system. <laughs> I like how everyone looks down here all of a sudden. Well, Salesforce is. <laughs> it has, this Salesforce. is it. Um, I, think, I think your premise is exactly right. I think that we're looking for new forms of trust. And trust is such an elusive concept. I mean, we talk about it all the time. We say our value, number one value is trust. We talk about it being something that's lost, something that's gained. But really, what is it? It goes back to this question. A lot of it's reliability. And one of the things that we did that was very counterintuitive um, when Salesforce was just a few years old, we were actually having some trouble with keeping our systems up. And you would get the calls from the customer. They didn't know what was going on. So we did something that was counterintuitive at that time. We put all of our availability online. And so customers could look at any point and check to see if our systems were up, how far they were up, any issues we were having. And while that could have been damaging, especially in our early years, it had the opposite effect. They trusted us. They knew the information was out there. Now, that was not a distributed system. That was directly from us. But I think as we look to blockchain, as we look to these other areas, we're seeing other areas that have the potential of giving people more areas to trust. But we've got to make sure first that they understand and know how those work. Giving your trust over too easily to a system, I think, can be also a real problem. There has to be that understanding and there has to be the development of that area before we want people to trust. And that's the bigger challenge. I couldn't agree with Amy more. I sort of see it's an interesting, it's always a complicated story, right? Because when you look at the development of these technology systems, I see a lot of young people of color really flocking to blockchain crypto because of this um, opportunity around the democracy democratization of finance when so many um, groups have been locked out of these systems. But then you also have the growing concern around sort of algorithmic justice. What does the coded gaze look like um, for folks of color, for women, where these systems just perpetuate the same sorts of structural inequities? And they're in some ways even better at it uh, because of the level of sophistication and complexity. Um, so couldn't agree with you more, but it's about how we sort of navigate our way through it together and sort of the policies that we have right. to develop, the guardrails that protect all of us. One more question to finish off. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I would like to start off by saying I'm a huge fan of your leadership style. Oh, thank you. And uh, for, as a person who works in uh, HR, I was wondering uh, how do you make sure that you uh, are uh, empl your employees and you're recruiting people with uh, similar kindness uh, in their work environment. Because in, in my opinion, I think if you have a ha happy employees, you have happy customers because they reflect their, their work environment onto their customer experiences when dealing with customers. And also, it makes sure that your, your employees stays in the, stay in the company and make sure that they want to make the company progress even more. So um, I want to ask when when, whenever you have a recruiting process going on. How do you make sure you uh, employ uh, your employees or the new employees are people with similar values instead of just working robots, you know, robots who just like want to, to deliver you whatever you're asking for and uh, where, where, where do you look for that um, humanitarian uh, aspect of people? Okay. Um, thank you. All right, thank you. So I think when you're looking for people and you're looking for how you're going to manage, how you're going to run a company, that there is an element of kindness that we don't talk about nearly enough. And I think that that comes from trust. People trust if they're going to be treated well and they're going to be treated kindly. And several years ago, I wrote an article that ran in um, the Toronto Globe and Mail talking about kindness as a management skill. And someone wrote in on the comments, this author doesn't get it. And they said, sometimes you've got to give people a kick, and sometimes you have to fire people. And I held myself back from responding. But here's what I wish I had said. I wish I had said, you're right. Sometimes you have to make tough decisions, and you have to fire people. You have to give people tough feedback. But there's never a point where that isn't better with kindness. Okay, we're going to have to wrap it up there. A very good point. Great. Nurturing kindness within, within your companies, nurturing leaders who are in it for the greater good, 
um, more accountability, effective institutions, transparency, engaging citizens, social inclusion. You've heard a heap of concrete examples from our leaders today. Thank you very much for joining the panel and thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you.